welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this podcast is for September 17th, 2023. Uh, we have the story, the familiar story of uh, Isaac, the promise of Isaac's birth uh, to Sarah and Abraham in Genesis 18, 1 through 15. And then we're inviting you to skip over to chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 7, just to finish out the story to uh, talk about um the, the fulfillment of that promise uh, the, and Isaac's birth there. Um, to, just to remind you, we're suggesting that you might um, think about this story along with the one from last week and the next two weeks uh, as being about the power of names. Uh, and we'll get into the, uh, the naming of Isaac uh, in this story as well. Uh, but let's just review quickly what happens in between last week and this week. Of course, uh, last week we were in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Uh, then we have, the, of course, the, the, the so-called fall, uh, and then lots of other stories like Noah and the, uh, and the Tower of Babel uh, and Cain and Abel, of course, as well. Um, but it, uh, I, I would suggest that as you preach this week, uh, you don't spend too much time on those stories, but you do uh, pause for a moment in Genesis 12 to talk about the call of Abraham. We uh, assign that text in other years of the narrative lectionary, but it's such a foundational text uh, for pretty much all of the Old Testament uh, that it's worth just pausing a bit and, and mentioning it this Sunday, I would say. So in Genesis 12, of course, God calls Abraham, uh, or Abram as he's called then, uh, to leave his homeland and his father's household in Mesopotamia and to travel to uh, the land that God will show him. And God promises him three things. He prom uh, God promises Abraham descendants, uh, that he will be the father of a great nation. Uh, he promises Abraham a uh, uh, blessing, that Abraham will be blessed and will be a blessing uh, to the whole world. Uh, and he promises Abraham the land that uh, of Canaan, the the what becomes known as the promised land. Um, it's this first promise, though, this promise of offspring and of uh, of being the father of a great nation. Uh, it's this this promise that is most problematic because one thing we know about Abraham uh, at the beginning uh, of the story, at, even at the end of chapter eleven, one thing we know is that Abraham's wife Sarai is barren, that he has no children. Uh, and it's hard to be the father of a great nation if you don't have even one child, right? So so this promise of God seems to, yeah, it, you know, just a small detail there, but uh, this promise of God seems to uh, be called into doubt right away. Um, my, my own uh, doctoral advisor and teacher and mentor, John Levinson, used to make the joke when he got to this story that, um, uh, infertility is hereditary. If your parents didn't have children, you won't have any either, right? Which is <laughs> a terrible joke, corny, uh, and perhaps a little insensitive, but uh, it was his favorite joke to tell when he got to this story. Um, so I pass it along to you. Uh, so, uh, so from chapter 12 to chapter 18, of course, some other things have happened. God makes a covenant with Abram. He changes his name to Abraham uh, and Sarai's name to Sarah. Uh, God all uh, God continues to promise Abram and Sarah um, to uh, descendants, uh, but nothing happens. And now Sarah is uh, like Abram's a hundred and Sarah's ninety, something like that. Um, and so they've taken matters into their own hands in the meantime. Uh, and this is probably worth mentioning in your sermon as well. And they've um, given uh, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, uh, an Egyptian slave woman, to Abraham as a concubine or second wife, and she has borne him uh, his first son, Ishmael. So uh, that's where we are uh, when we get to the beginning of chapter 18, um, where the Lord appears to Abraham by the Oaks of Mamre. So uh, let's get into that story now. But it, again, it's worth providing a bit of the background to remind your congregation of what comes before this. I have three things to say about this text. I'll say one uh, first, and that is that the scene gets going with an act of incredible hospitality. 
on the yes. on the behalf of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, the Middle East, the ancient Near East, sorry, was a world of hospitality. There were not hotels or inns, so when strangers came through, you were expected to show hospitality. Here come three strangers, but. Abraham does not just show a little hospitality. He shows a lot. He gets the best flour. That's like real flour, not just barley. Or, or So it's the finest. Then he goes and he gets veal. He gets, he gets, he gets the fattened calf mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and puts out a feast. And this, hosp this act of hospitality then is the, uh, the setting for the revelation. I, I piggyback that because uh, um, this isn't the first time that uh, uh, Abraham has had uh, a, 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 a visitor, a guest, um, and um, there's a giddiness to the way he goes about. Uh, and and, and I, I think that's worth you. You mentioned uh, uh, last uh, week about... Uh, 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 about having uh, children uh, act out a scene, I, I think it's worth paying attention to the fact that there's a, a high energy. There's there's like a giddiness as as Abraham rushes to get things, and and instead of having um, his servants do it or even have Sarah do it, he does it himself. You can almost see him over everybody else saying, "No, no, 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 use this one. No, 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 get more. Ah, try the best." So it is an extreme hospitality. Don't miss that. Enjoy this this particular episode. Yeah, I, I like that word giddiness. I think it captures a lot of the tone of the story. So uh, my my um, one of my favorite verses here is, is right at the end of the passage we're suggesting, verse 15, uh, where Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. Uh, well, let me back up for a minute. Uh, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Now, some commentators read this as a, as a rebuke, and I don't, I don't hear that at all. It really depends how you hear the tone of this passage. But I, I actually think God is laughing with Sarah, right? Like gently kind of ribbing her a little bit, right? Why did Sarah laugh? Oh, yeah, she did laugh, right? Like first talking about her in the third person and then talking directly to her. That I don't think God minds Sarah's laughter, I guess is what I want to say. I think there's a kind of joy in this whole and a kind of ridiculousness, <laughs> Uh, yes. But but in the best possible sense of that word, right? Uh, uh, about this story, um, I always think about uh, Frederick Buechner's book, uh, uh, "Telling the Truth: The Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale," and he uses this story to talk about the comedy of God's uh, work in the world, the comedy of the gospel. But it's comedy in the in the classical sense, right? Not not like three stooges or, or physical comedy, but it's the comedy of, of something so extraordinarily hard to believe that happens to be true, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the comedy of something so good happening uh, that, uh, and something so extraordinarily unexpected, but so good uh, that makes us laugh uh, in, in joy, right? right? Not, in, not in scorn or not in derision, but in joy. And that's what I see here, right? I did not laugh. Oh, yes, you did laugh, right? And that that I, question, I'll just say one more thing, and then, sorry, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? That's that's a key verse here, I think, uh, that you could, uh, I, I would suggest that you as preachers play with, right? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? No. Uh, you know, the angel Gabriel, a few thousand years later, says nothing is impossible with God, right? In another annunciation of a birth, right? The angel Gabriel answers that question. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? No, nothing is impossible with God. And then that, that uh, Catherine, I appreciate it because that, that allows the giddiness of, of Abraham to, to, to fill out this full story is, is that there's, there's this, um, there's this 
joy that's underneath it. There's this wonder that's in the midst of everything that's happening here. Um, the promise is this, this scene becomes when the promise becomes real, um, that, that, for all of these previous scenes, it's been a promise that seems unfulfilled. And here with the meal and with hospitality and with a little um, a frivolity, um, I, I agree with your reading. I think that there's this conversation and, and I, I preached a sermon where I asked the question, would you laugh? I mean, would, when something that incredulous is offered to you, and you you can't see it. You've done things to get in the way of it. <laughs> yeah, right. Should I think that this is going to happen? And and this gets to how uh, this is wrapped up in chip twenty one, uh, because that's exactly what happens. Is that God does indeed give her this child, and she calls him laughter, yeah. and yeah, yeah. it's it's the wonder that after all of this, God fulfills this promise to me, uh, Sarah speaking, an old barren woman. Yeah, I would laugh. Yeah, I love what the, she uh, says in chapter 21. God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she names him laughter. Yeah, yeah the second thing, um, by the way, uh, this, this is really poorly translated, I think, um, in the NRSV anyway. For for example, in verse 15, when it says, but Sarah denied, it's actually the word lie. But Sarah <laughs> lied, yeah. saying, I didn't laugh. Yeah. And and uh, Peterson in the message gets that right. Um, but also, first of all, when it says, Sarah laughed to herself. Hmm. Uh, the phrase to herself is in her belly. Sarah laughed in her belly, which is, of course, the source of her pain. Uh, yeah. uh, and my old teacher, Roy Harrisville, who was 101 and died this summer, wrote this f f more than 60 years ago about this passage. He said, um, when God promised her a son, she just tilted her head back and let go a belly laugh to make <laughs> Abraham's tent quiver. It was irreverent, blasphemous, but one thing you'll have to say for it, it did mark the distance between her shriveled antique hulk, which promised a future of only warts, breast cancer, and a hearing aid, and the word of God. Uh, old Roy, uh, even when he was young Roy, had a way of getting right at it. Um, Sarah is Sarah's laughter of pain comes out of her own suffering. Yeah. And it's not, by the way, just her body. Uh, that is incapable of having a child, it's Abraham's. Right. And so when it says, shall I have pleasure? That means sexual pleasure. My husband is old. And so if I, have to, I have to map this out for people, right? There's no Viagra yet. And so <laughs> Sarah can't conceive and Abraham cannot uh, produce. And so the whole thing seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And of course, nothing is impossible for God. And that, of course, you've already hit on it. Um, this is the very identity of God. Uh, if God had a business card, it would say, raises from the dead. Um, nothing is passions. too wonderful for the Lord. Turns disbelieving laughter into Easter laughter.